so my name is Sean Heffron. I'm a, a preventive cardiologist here at NYU and work in the Prevention Center with Dr. Goodman and many of the other lecturers you've seen throughout our, our series, if, if you've been to a number of them. Um, I have a specific uh, clinical interest in, in lifestyle modification for the prevention of cardiovascular disease and in particular on treating patients with dyslipidemias and obesity. And my research interest, uh, which is where I actually right now spend the majority of my time, is focused on how obesity contributes to uh, increased risk for heart disease and how different ways of losing weight may uh, differently affect people's risk for developing heart disease. And that's something that is going to be part of the focus of my, my lecture today. Uh, we have uh, two other lecturers who will be, who will be following me. Uh, Paige Iliano is a registered dietitian here, and I'll be introducing her, and Dr. Jose Aleman, an endocrinologist and weight loss specialist at NYU, who will be following me. Uh, so without further ado, I'm here to kind of set the stage and to give you a brief overview of the obesity epidemic, how it contributes to heart disease, uh, and then kind of give you some insight onto my focus, which has actually been on bariatric surgery and how it can be used to reduce uh, heart disease risk in the setting of uh, severe obesity. So as you all are probably well aware, over the past 30 years uh, across the United States and every state in the nation, there has been a basic, nearly an exponential increase in the, the prevalence of obesity. Uh, and that's generally measured these days as a, a BMI, a body mass index of greater than, than 30. And in association with uh, this increase in obesity has come many concomitant uh, medical problems uh, that are associated with obesity. And so the, the focus, as I alluded to today, is how obesity specifically affects your heart and blood vessels. Obviously, it affects the whole body, which I think Dr. Aleman is going to give us a brief intro to uh, in one of his slides today, but we're going to be focused largely on, on the heart and blood vessels because that's uh, kind of what our, our prevention center is, is uh, the focus of, the prevention of heart disease. And this is a relatively simple slide, but, but I like it just because it, rather than getting down the nitty gritty details mech, uh, on the molecular level of how obesity uh, affects heart disease, this kind of gives you a bird's eye view of some of the, the ways in which obesity has negative impacts on, on your heart and blood vessels. And specifically, the, the blood vessels, uh, this uh, circle here describes endothelial dysfunction. So the endothelium or endothelial cells are very thin cells that line all the blood vessels of your body. And they basically keep what's in your blood in the blood and outside of the, the blood vessel escaping from there. And when you have problems with that endothelium and a weakening, uh, then you can get things that are escaping from the blood into the wall of the blood vessel, specifically cholesterol and things like that that start to build up. And that's the, the genesis of, of atherosclerosis, which then contributes to heart attacks and strokes. So when you have problems with endothelial cell function, which is uh, one uh, side effect of obesity, uh, and also you have atherogenic dyslipidemia, which basically means high levels of bad cholesterol, LDL, or low levels of the good HDL cholesterol, high triglycerides. You're more prone to having that cholesterol escape from the blood vessel, get into the wall, and start to develop plaques. Uh, inflammation, which is present in obesity and derives largely from the excess fat or adipose tissue, present in obesity causes increased levels of inflammatory mediators and chemicals that circulate in the blood that are there, you know, evolutionarily to protect us from things. But when you're obese, that you get excess levels of those circulating all the time, which can further weaken uh, the blood vessel wall and increase the risk for developing atherosclerosis. A prothrombotic state is also present in obesity. So what does that mean? That means that you're at increased risk for developing blood clots, both on the kind of the low pressure venous side, if you've heard of a DVT or a blood clot in your legs, people who are obese are at elevated risk for that. But then more specifically on the arterial side, which is where you have a heart attack or a stroke, 
obesity is associated with increased risk of that. Insulin resistance, probably no surprise. Insulin resistance is basically the defining characteristic of, and severe insulin resistance is present in diabetes, uh, which is definitely very highly associated with obesity, as, as we'll see. And then hypertension, again, both has direct effects on the heart muscle itself, which can make it enlarged and thickened and paradoxically weak. Uh, but then also causes a weakening and dysfunction of those endothelial cells in the blood in the that carry blood throughout the body. So kind of a, a number of, of negative consequences that are highly associated with obesity. And when you have all of those things going on in the blood vessels, then greater weight uh, is associated with a greater risk of developing heart failure. And in all of these figures I'm going to show you, the higher your BMI or the higher your class of obesity, you'll see higher rates of developing uh, different conditions. So heart failure, here you have exponential increases in the risk of diabetes, both in women and in men. And this is stopping at a BMI of 35. It just keeps going up as you get to higher levels of BMI. And then uh, higher weight and BMI or waist to hip ratio, basically the amount of fat around the middle increases your risk of atherosclerosis, which is that buildup of cholesterol in plaque in the wall of the artery, which in the setting of endothelial dysfunction can lead to the formation of a blood clot there. And that's what happens, that's the feared consequences. That's what happens in a heart attack uh, or a stroke. And then when, in the worst case scenario, in the setting of that heart attack or stroke, you end up getting death from, from heart disease. And the risk of that also starts to increase exponentially in both men and women as you get to higher levels of BMI. So obesity is, is not a friend uh, to the heart, obviously. So then how do we avoid these negative consequences of obesity? Well, I, maybe it's obvious. Uh, weight loss is definitely easier said than done, as, as many of us uh, recognize. Uh, but the, in the end, that's really the best way to, to counteract and fight against all of these negative consequences associated with obesity. But then does it matter how we lose weight? You know, there are lots of different ways and you, know, you can go to the bookstore and find 500 different diet books and there are medications. So it doesn't matter how we lose weight. I, I'd argue to a, to a degree, yes, and we're gonna hear about ways to change your diet to lose weight, medications available to lose weight. I'm gonna focus on surgical interventions for losing weight in the setting of severe obesity and how it might matter actually what surgery you get uh, in regard to reducing specifically your heart disease risk. So bariatric surgery is not for everybody, uh, obviously, but in, in the setting of severe obesity, meaning uh, someone who has a BMI of more than 40 or is more than 100 pounds overweight, or someone who has a BMI of over 35, and at least one of these obesity-related comorbidities, so a condition that is frequently associated with obesity, and I've highlighted here just the, the cardiac and cardiovascular-specific ones, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, dyslipidemia, so high levels of LDL cholesterol or triglycerides, low HDL, or sleep apnea, then it, it's really a, a recognized, very most effective intervention for the purposes of losing weight uh, in individuals with these uh, uh, characteristics. And it's been repeatedly shown that bariatric surgery does significantly improve someone's heart disease risk factors. So in, in a study that took a look at all of the published research on bariatric surgery now about six years ago, they found that the average uh, reduction in body weight was about 54%. 60, there was a 63% improvement in high blood pressure, 73% uh, improvements in diabetes, and nearly two-thirds improvement in, in dyslipidemia or problems with cholesterol. And so these are all risk factors, but does bariatric surgery actually reduce your chances of, of heart disease itself, of a heart attack, a stroke, or dying from a heart attack or stroke? And I would argue that I, I think we're pretty, I'm pretty confident that it does. The, the best study research-wise that we have of bariatric surgery was done in Sweden and is ongoing. They're still following these people that started having bariatric surgery almost 30 years ago. 
And when they followed them out to almost 20 years, they found that there was a 17% reduction in, this is called cardiovascular events, that's our term for heart attacks and strokes, and in the end, almost a 44% reduction in the chances of dying from one of those things. So very effective at reducing heart attack, stroke, dying from them, probably because of the reasons that it reduces, it improves diabetes, improves blood pressure, uh, and things of that sort. However, as, as, kind of, as an academic, I think it's, it's interesting that this study, while it seems to show that heart disease is improved with, with bariatric surgery, almost all of the data, or at least two-thirds of the data from the study came from a procedure that actually isn't performed anymore. They used to do a procedure called vertical banded gastroplasty very commonly, but over time, surgeons and other people recognized that it had a lot of complications that were, were not very beneficial to the patients, and so they stopped doing it. So, you know, it's, it's good, but we don't use it anymore, so can we actually extrapolate that to other people? Furthermore, you know, there were three procedures total involved in this study. Yeah, the one that we don't do anymore, but two procedures which we do, gastric bypass and gastric banding. And so are they all equivalent then? You know, is one procedure just as good uh, as the other? And I would argue that you can just look at the change in weight after, one, after the three procedures and get the suggestion that, well, you know, probably not. Maybe they're not all created equal. Here we have the gastric banding, vertical banded gastroplasty, and gastric bypass. These are the people who didn't have any surgery. Obviously, that's not uh, a very effective way to, to go out losing the weight. But they obviously, you can see a very big difference in the amount of weight loss by these three procedures with gastric bypass seemingly being uh, quite superior to the other two procedures. And so that became a, a big research interest uh, of mine is kind of comparing from a heart disease standpoint how the current contemporary bariatric surgeries may affect different chance, uh, risks of cardiovascular disease. And these I, here I have represented the four currently performed uh, bariatric surgical procedures. And as I alluded to, the SOS, this, that Swedish study, was started now over 30 years ago, but that the data suggested gastric bypass was more effective of a procedure. Even in more modern day uh, research, the, it's gone on, others have gone on to demonstrate that certainly gastric bypass is superior to the adjustable gastric banding procedure here in the measure of body weight, as well as improvements in diabetes measures, cholesterol levels, and high level, and levels of high blood pressure. In some of my own research, I've focused on cholesterol levels because that's of particular interest to me. And we looked at levels of HDL, so the good cholesterol, you want that to go up after you're when you're losing weight. And we found that Roux and Y gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy were the most effective in that regard. They both increased it on average 11 points. When you look at LDL cholesterol, though, the bad cholesterol, we actually saw a little bit different uh, outcome. And we saw here that the gastric bypass procedure uh, was superior, along with this biliopancreatic diversion procedure, which I'm not going to talk about in great detail. It's, it's pretty rare, honestly, and for, reserved for people who are very, very, very seriously uh, obese. Furthermore, the, the frequency with which bariatric surgery is performed currently, both in the United States and around the world, has changed dramatically. So if I had been giving this lecture 10 years ago, almost all of the procedures performed would have been that gastric bypass and adjustable gastric banding. That's why I was able to show a few slides ago that head-to-head -head comparison between the two. But over the last 10 years, the, the prevalence of different procedures has changed dramatically. You can see here, sleeve gastrectomy, abbreviated SG, wasn't really performed at all. But now in 2014, and still even more so in 2018, it's become the most commonly performed procedure. So things have changed over time. And as, I, as you can see here, certainly the majority of the procedures performed currently are either this gastric bypass procedure or sleeve gastrectomy. So I'd just like to talk about those two, because if, if anyone here was interested in getting bariatric surgery and went to see a surgeon, this is almost invariably the decision you'd be making between one of these two uh, procedures. And in the subsequent slides, I'm going to represent the gastric bypass in blue 
and sleeve gastrectomy in red. So up until six months ago, actually, we had very little information in regard to head-to-head -head comparisons of these two procedures. All that we had was a, a trial called the Stampede trial, which was one at, done at a single center at the Cleveland Clinic uh, in Ohio. And they did a head-to-head -head comparison of the gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, and then medicines. And these were all obese people who had diabetes, but it only included 150 people. This is despite the fact in the U.S. alone, we do 200,000 of these surgeries annually. So little numbers of people actually, despite the fact that these are done all the time. And when you looked at the effects of these surgery at three years after they were done, uh, you saw that people who were just left on medicines had a reduction in their BMI of 1.6. The sleeve gastrectomy folks had a reduction of about seven. And those who had gastric bypass lost a, about nine BMI points. So certainly seems that gastric bypass is a little bit better in that regard. Now, all these patients were diabetic, and so they were very concerned about hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of your blood sugar level over the last three months or so. And medical therapy, you know, started off doing all right, but not great long term. The two surgeries seemed to do pretty well, maybe equivalent in regard to the reductions in blood sugar. However, when you look down a little bit in more detail, you'll see that those individuals who had sleeve gastrectomy still tended to be on one medicine, whereas those who got gastric bypass were on about half. So there was a significant, they, they both improved blood sugar, but the gastric bypass patients were actually able to get off medicines. And 60% of them didn't take any diabetes medicines, whereas only one third were able to stop their medicines in the, the sleeve gastrectomy group. And then as I alluded to, up until six months ago, that was the only head-to-head -head comparison we had. But in the last six months, we've had two studies that have been published with much greater numbers of patients to compare these two procedures. So the room, this is called the sleeve pass trial. It was a head-to-head -head comparison of about 120 people undergoing both of the procedures. You can see that both procedures here tend to have a significant amount of weight loss going from a BMI of about 46 to about 36. And there doesn't seem to be a big difference here, although there's definitely a lot of display between the two procedures. And when you statistically look and compare them, you can see here this favors bypass. There was definitely at 12, 36, and 60 months after surgery, the gastric bypass procedure was superior for weight loss. And furthermore, this procedure improved blood sugar, blood pressure, and cholesterol levels better than the sleeve gastrectomy procedure. And then the last study that came out recently this year was another comparison of about 110 patients in each surgical group. And they also found that ruin y gastric bypass was superior for the improvement of cholesterol levels. Although in this study, they found that blood sugar and weight change were similar between the two procedures. I think but I'm I'm about to finish up my part of the, the evening now, but I, I would be remiss, I would say, if without mentioning one thing that's been noticed more recently as more and more of the sleeve gastrectomy procedures have been performed, and that's the fact that gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, as, as you may uh, be aware, tends to increase uh, in a not small gr number of patients who undergo the sleeve gastrectomy procedure. And in some places, they've reported up to 15% of patients developing what's called Barrett's esophagus, which can sometimes go on to uh, developing into esophageal cancer after this procedure. So this is a procedure that really wasn't performed 10 years ago. And so with time, we tend to understand some of the, the un, you know, initially unbeknown side effects of procedures as we follow people over time. So just to summarize, you know, my talk, all bariatric procedures produce weight loss, regardless of, of, of what they are. And in association with that weight loss comes improved insulin resistance and blood sugar, better cholesterol levels, a reduction in blood pressure, reduction in body fat, and concurrently reductions in levels of inflammation throughout the body. Uh, however, the degree of the heart disease risk factor improvement does vary by procedure. And I hope I've kind of made it evident that the gastric bypass procedure has broadly the greatest effectiveness of current procedures in regard to improving cardiovascular risk. 
And although sleeve gastrectomy is currently the most common procedure, we, we don't have a lot of information watching patients beyond five years, and the head-to-head -head data that we do have uh, is inferior, in my opinion, to the gastric bypass. So that is uh, my spiel about an introduction to, uh, to obesity and how we can modulate uh, uh, obesity risk with bariatric surgery. How do I exit? And with, with that, I'm going to welcome our next speaker, uh, Paige Iliano, who is a, a registered dietitian nutritionist here in New York. And as I alluded to, she's here at, at NYU with us. She earned her bachelor's degree in food and nutrition from the University of, of Alabama and did her dietetic internship at Long Island University Post. And she's currently a research dietitian affiliated with NYU Center for Healthful Behavior Change. And she's going to be speaking with us today about strategies for modifying your diet to achieve weight loss and obesity. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Paige Iliano, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about some really practical strategies that you could use to make nutritious decisions when you're eating out um, at restaurants, whether you're interested in heart health or weight loss or general health. Um, these tips really apply across the board. So um, I just wanted to go over why we dine out when we really know that Dining out can contribute to increased calorie consumption, increased sodium intake, um, but ultimately it is less hassle, it's convenient. Um, many of us don't have the time to cook at home, especially more women are working now than there were years ago. Also, taste is a perk, the social aspect, going out with your friends, eating out, um, and there's no cooking required. So. I'm not here to tell you not to dine out today, um, but I'm just here to give you some helpful strategies for when you do. So what is the downside? Um, increased calories, increased portion size, both can contribute to overeating. If we're doing this frequently, it can lead to some weight gain as well. And we know that obesity is a primary risk factor for heart disease. Um, in addition, we have some reduced diet quality observed for those who frequently dine out. Um, we may be missing out on key vitamins and minerals. Um, there's USDA data that shows that eating out, we're consuming more of the over-consumed nutrients and less of the under-consumed nutrients like calcium, fiber, iron. So eating out frequently may lead to some reduced diet quality. Also excess sodium, um, which we know leads to potentially high blood pressure, and cardiovascular disease, so we want to limit the sodium intake, and it is shown that the majority of sodium intake in the American diet does come from processed food and restaurant food. And with restaurant food, we can't really control what is going into it, so there may be a whole bunch of salt, sugar, fat that we don't really realize is in that food. So this is just a little example of how our portions have increased over the past few years. Um, what we were getting 20 years ago compared to what we're getting today is quite different. And if we were to be served today one of these smaller portions, we'd probably be like, what's going on? <laughs> um, because we're just now used to these larger portions, and we tend to consume what's on our plate um, without really thinking about it. So how do we combat this? Um, there are some references that we can use that may be helpful to think about when you are dining out. So, for instance, three ounces of meat is about the size of a deck of cards or a mouse on a mouse pad. Um, a cup of pasta is the size of about your fist. And I know that everyone's hands are different sizes, so <laughs> keep that in mind. But the hand is a tool that you always have with you just to think about when you're being served. So you can say, okay, wow, I'm really getting, you know, maybe three cups of pasta on my plate compared to one. You can also use your thumb. A tablespoon is about the size of your thumb. The tip of your thumb is about a teaspoon. So just things to keep in mind when you're eating out and you don't have, um, you know, you're not able to measure exactly what you're getting. The MyPlate method is another method um, that you can use. 
basically we would like half of our plate to be fruits and vegetables or just 50% vegetables. Um, so I have a bunch of cuisines that I'd like to go through to talk to you about, and we only have a brief amount of time today, so I couldn't fit every type of cuisine in, but the good thing is that these tips are kind of applicable to other cuisines that are out there. So we'll just go through a little bit. Um, with Asian food, steamed over fried is always the best. And a lot of these tips are common sense and you may already be aware of them, but it's good to get that refresher. Um, brown rice over white rice, you're gonna get more fiber, more vitamins and minerals, and that extra fiber in whole grains is going to help to keep you full and satisfied for a longer period of time. Um, any dishes with vegetables are a good choice. Again, you're getting in more fiber there. Choose the low sodium options when you can. Um, Soy sauce is very high in sodium, and even when it's labeled less sodium, it could still have up to 500 milligrams of sodium in there. Um, so be careful with that and choose low sodium. Also, using chopsticks is a great idea. It helps us to slow down while we eat, and when we're eating more slowly, our body has time to process that we are feeling more full, and it gives us time to start to digest and be more aware of our hunger cues. So instead of these options on the left, maybe we'd like to go for some of the ones on the right. Um, even though, you know, General Chow's chicken is great and spare ribs, you definitely want to consume those in moderation if you do choose to have them. And try to go for steamed vegetable dumplings, the vegetable and protein dishes. And usually there's what's called a diet menu on a Chinese menu and that option will not have the sauces on there. You could choose to get your sauce on the side and add it yourself. Um, Mugu Gai Pan is a good one. It's a sauteed vegetables and meat dish. Tofu is a great option. Um, there's about 65 calories and three ounces of tofu, so it's really light. And it is also a great source of plant-based protein, um, eggplant. So Thai is another really great option where you can find a lot of healthy options. Um, so instead of some of these, um, maybe go for these. So edamame is a great source of plant-based protein as well, which can help to keep you feel full. Um, it also contains soy. Curry is a great one. It contains turmeric, so that gives it its yellow color, and that is known to have an anti-inflammatory properties. Um, so Thai food uses a lot of great spices like ginger, cur um, a bunch of great spices that will help to give you some anti-inflammatory benefits. Summer roll, satay, just be careful with the peanut sauce portion sizes. Sushi. So rather than some of these options, spicy or crunchy or tempura usually means that it was fried. The mayo cream cheese is going to have um, more calories, more fat added to the meal. Spicy tuna usually uses a mayo-based sauce. And the eel rolls are usually... Um, they use a brown sugar type of sauce. So these are better options. Sashimi in Nigeria, this has the raw meat. The Nigeria has the little rice ball under the meat. Um, of course, that's only if you're into that and many people aren't. <laughs> so there's also some other healthier sushi options, the salmon avocado, California roll, a seaweed salad, and you can ask for sushi with brown rice. All right, so Italian. Avoid the creamy sauces. Tomato-based and olive oil is a great way to go. Um, we know that olive oil can help with cholesterol as well. Um, pass up on the bread and bread sticks, especially when you're taking to go. That's a great time where you're easily able to pass up on taking that with you in the bag. Um, or if you do choose to have bread, choose bread and olive oil rather than bread and butter. Uh, fill up on the salads and vegetables first, then go for the pasta. Say yes to seafood, especially if it's grilled or roasted rather than breaded and fried. So instead of these, you can try a house salad with oil and vinegar. Skip the croutons. Um, Italian food has a lot of great vegetable sides that you can order. Ask for whole wheat pasta rather than regular. A pomodoro, a marinara. Primavera, ask for more vegetables than pasta, and you'll notice there's a lot of asking that you could do when you go out to eat, and I think people feel 
like they're being kind of annoying when they do that, but really it's for your own benefit, for your health. And grilled eggplant or chicken. New York pizza. So we all love pizza here. <laughs> um, every ounce contributes about 80 calories, and especially in New York, we have huge pizzas. It can be up to eight ounces, maybe more. Um, this group analyzed 12 different New York pizza restaurants a few years ago, and they averaged out to be about 600 calories and 17 grams of fat for one regular slice. So just keeping that in mind. <laughs> so instead of some of these options, buffalo chicken pizza, we tend to have with a side of blue cheese or ranch, um, garlic knots, maybe try asking for half cheese if, they're, if you see that they're preparing the pizza. Um, you can load up on the vegetables, so at least you're getting some nutrition in there. Get one slice instead of two, um, and maybe instead of the second slice, get a side salad instead. Or try a salad slice. They're actually good. <laughs> or split it with a friend. You can have them cut it up for you right then and there, and that way you're not tempted. Leave the crust behind. Um, just a bunch of little strategies that can really add up when you make these small changes. And skip the soda. Sometimes we assume that pizza and soda just go hand in hand. Um, maybe try a seltzer so you'll still get that fizz. Mexican. Um, so we'd like to skip the chips. Of course, if you want to enjoy your night out, maybe just serve yourself a single portion of 15 or 16 or so, however many, a small portion of chips, and then let that be your serving, and then move on because um, it's easy to just keep going for more. You can also swap Greek yogurt for sour cream. If you haven't tried this, I really recommend trying it. You could use a plain non-fat Greek yogurt. Um, it really adds that similar consistency that sour cream gives you, but it's giving you less calories, less fat in there. And you may not even realize the difference. Uh, go for soft shells instead of crispy. The crispy ones are usually fried. Avoid the cheesier dishes and the queso. So instead of some of these options, we might want to choose these. So corn tortillas, uh, they have a little bit less calories and fat than the flour. You can also get a whole wheat tortilla to add fiber there. Fajitas are a great option. Um, lean proteins are great. Guacamole is really great. It contains those omega-3 fatty acids that are beneficial for heart health and brain health. Um, just be careful on the portions. Guacamole is very easy to overeat. And go for a side of black beans. That's going to also add some plant-based protein to your diet as well and some fiber. Um, tacos are a great choice as well. You can get the grilled meat, vegetables. Greek food. So, again, we're passing up on the extra bread, extra pita that isn't really necessary um, to the meal or you can ask for whole wheat pita instead, at least you're getting some added nutrition in there. Um, when you get the whole wheat, your blood sugars go up more slowly than they would with a refined white pita. Um, ask for feta cheese on the side, they tend to go heavy on the cheese. So instead of some of these options, you can go for these. So tzatziki is a great one, it's a cucumber-based sauce, or dip really, and they use cucumber and olive oil in there. Souvlaki is these grilled vegetable skewers, sometimes, uh, or grilled meat and vegetable skewers. Um, the plaki is a fish dish. The dolmas are the stuffed grape leaves. A Greek salad is a great choice. And again, you could ask for feta on the side or dressing on the side, and then put on your own. Deli sandwiches. So whole grain, again, more fiber. On a sandwich, try eating only half of it or you know, save half for later or eat just half of the bread and take the top half off. You can ask for scooped bread. Some people feel very burdensome doing this, but it is an option and there's more room then for vegetables and it does take out um, some of that bread, some of those calories. Pass on the side of chips. That's another pairing that we often just assume goes together, sandwich and chips. Try carrots or apples or fruit on the side, something else. For sandwiches, instead of these, more processed meats or salads here. So the tuna chicken and egg salad, they're better if you're making them at home, but when you're eating them out, they tend to go really heavy on the mayo and you don't really know exactly what's going in them. So it's always good to go for fresh meats, grilled, lean protein sources. 
try adding avocado instead of cheese. Try adding more vegetables in there. A sandwich is a great opportunity to add in extra vegetables to spice it up. Um, choosing mustard over mayo for less calories as well and less fat. Um, ask for less cheese. You can see here how much cheese can go on a deli sandwich. Bagels is another big New York favorite. Um, so instead of cream cheese, butter, a white bagel, those are your typical options. These are some other choices. A mini bagel is great because you're still getting the satisfaction of eating your whole bagel, um, but you are getting much less. Or go for a whole wheat bagel, split the bagel with a friend or take half to go. And these are some alternative toppings, not your typical bagel toppings, but um, just things to try. You can also ask for the toppings on the side. You can see it here, how much cream cheese can go on a bagel. They really <laughs> fit it all in there. So ask for it on the side and apply yourself and you'll have more of an opportunity to control your portions. Or again, ask for a scooped bagel. Ask if low fat cream cheese is available. Water, so this is a huge point when we're going out to eat. Limit those sugar sweetened beverages. Um, we know that these can really increase calorie intake and you're not getting nutrition from these. In addition, we'd like to limit alcohol. So alcohol and going out to eat don't have to go hand in hand. So especially if you're dining out frequently, uh, we do know that alcohol can increase our calorie intake and it can increase our appetite. Even the next day, we might notice that we're hungrier. So limit that as well. Um, Opt for water when you can. You can spruce up your water by adding lemon or lime or using seltzer. Um, especially when we're going out to eat, we, there does tend to be more sodium in the meal, so try to increase your water intake. So top takeaways, go in with a plan. Look at the menu ahead of time and go in there prepared. It tends to be if we show up at a restaurant ravenous, um, we're not gonna make the healthiest decisions. If we go in there knowing what we're prepared to order, um, things will go better. Choose water rather than sugar-sweetened beverages like sodas or tea, iced teas. Um, take half to go at the beginning of the meal. That's a great way to avoid that temptation of finishing your plate and just starting off on the right foot. You can split with a friend. That's another great way to reduce um, the calories you're consuming and just enjoy the social aspect of the meal. Um, visualize those my plate and portion references. So try to make half your plate vegetables. Um, Go for whole grains wherever you can. Go heavy on the vegetables. And don't be afraid to ask. So ask for whatever you can to try and make the healthiest um, choices at the meal. Also, ordering anything that you can on the side and adding yourself. The restaurants tend to go heavy on everything. So dressing, sauces, and any toppings that you can order on the side, I would recommend. And also eat mindfully and enjoy it. Sometimes we get so excited when we're out to eat and we'll scarf down the meal. You don't even remember having it because you were so excited. So really slow down and enjoy it and don't feel guilty afterwards. Just let yourself have that experience. And this is just, it's called healthydiningfinder.com. It's a resource that you can use to find healthy restaurants near you. Um, it's good if you're on vacation or in a new area, you don't really know where to go. It can give you some good options if you put in your zip code and it was created by a team of dietitians. And thank you so much. Unfortunately, I won't be able to make the panel. So if you have any questions, you can contact me and I left my email on here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paige. And our, our final speaker of the evening is Dr. Jose uh, Aleman. Uh, Dr. Aleman is an assistant professor of endocrinology here at NYU. Uh, he completed his uh, MD and PhD degrees at Harvard Medical School and MIT, and then came to New York uh, for further training in medicine and endocrinology at Cornell. He joined us here uh, to, to our great benefit in 2016, and since then has started a research program studying uh, inflammation uh, associated with obesity, and clinically he runs the, uh, the weight management clinic at the Manhattan VA. And so, Dr. Aleman, thank you. Thank you, Sean, for the kind introduction, and uh, thanks everyone for attending. 
Um, I, as Sean mentioned, I am an endocrinologist and I treat patients uh, who have complications of their weight, in particular in a way that treats both the complications and the weight. And what I'll share with you uh, this evening is briefly how I think of, of my patients as they come to us and uh, a little bit of the work that we're trying to do to understand the many diseases that are uh, under the umbrella of obesity or, or excess weight. Uh, I speak to other doctors, and this means that I've spoken to them, and I'm fortunate that my lab is funded by a few uh, uh, foundations like Doris Duke and American Heart Association. I will actually not discuss off-label uh, use. Uh, this is in case there were anyone who was more interested. Uh, just to mention briefly that um, as uh, Dr. Heffron uh, alluded to in the beginning, obesity has very clear cardiovascular complications, but uh, beyond that, as an endocrinologist, uh, I tend to focus on the complications uh, outlined on this side. What you may not be aware of is that excess weight in the form of obesity is associated with many other diseases uh, that we are recognizing uh, as we uh, research. Some of these, uh, like cancer, for instance, was an interest of many of my colleagues um, uh, when I was doing my training at Cornell. And uh, obesity, to give you an example, is becoming the most common ca preventable cause of cancer overtaking smoking in the United States. So it's a reason to act on, on this beyond um, the immediate cardiometabolic complications. Um, our understanding of obesity starts up here in the brain, and this is a diagram that I use from the um, uh, guidelines that we endocrinologists use to treat obesity, just to allude to two points, that the pathways that control appetite and upon which obesity medicines act are very complicated. We don't understand them fully, uh, but they essentially try to do one of two things. They either try to increase uh, signaling through neurons through the brain that leads to decreased appetite uh, or decrease uh, neurons in the brain that increase your appetite. So most of the medicines that we have at this point really work in the brain. And um, as we understand better uh, treatment for obesity, like, like gastric bypass and others, we'll hopefully have better tools to address those. Uh, Dr. Heffern alluded to inflammation. Uh, that's a research interest of mine as well, specifically uh, trying to understand how uh, fat or adipose tissue as people gain weight becomes dysfunctional. Uh, we know that when fat becomes doesn't work right, it actually attracts immune cells, and these immune cells cause a low-grade uh, inflammation. This is very low compared to what you'd expect, say, from an infection or from an autoimmune disease. But it is enough to eventually cause a cascade that leads to secretion of uh, other substances that can affect the heart. And the pathways by which uh, these complications come about are, um, are under study, and this is some of the aspects that Dr. Heffern and I study. Um, we have guidelines by which we treat obese patients, um, and these are some of the more recent ones that allude to uh, uh, some of the cardiovascular complications, the ACC is the American College of Cardiology and the Obesity Society got together in 2013 to uh, think uh, holistically how we could potentially uh, incorporate these aspects that you've heard of today, namely diet, as Paige mentioned, uh, medications, which I'll mention very briefly, and then surgery, as Dr. Heffern mentioned, to treat patients um, uh, who have complications of their weight. And all that to say that it all starts with measuring the weight, as Dr. Uh, Heffern alluded to in terms of the body mass index. Uh, a large amount uh, involves um, advice in terms of nutrition, and that's really the foundation uh, uh, over which all of these treatments um, work. If, if the foundation of nutrition is not there, nothing else really works. And then as we uh, try different cycles, we go back and forth and try uh, more aggressive interventions depending on the degree of complications like medicines or surgery. When, when a patient walks in and I see them in weight management clinic, an important question that I ask them is, um, in addition to their weight history, uh, I should say the first thing that I do is ask him about their weight history. Let me step back. And actually, I often find um, it helpful to have patients draw their weight history. So uh, many of you um, might have the experience that you had your ideal weight finishing high school, 
Uh, and then uh, for men, oftentimes, for my veterans, for instance, their ideal weight is right after service. They leave service, they gain weight. Uh, for women, oftentimes, it's the childbearing ages you, that you gain the baby weight and it doesn't go away. So there's definitely events in our lives that mark how we all gain weight. So I actually have patients draw their weight history. Another aspect that as doctors we are becoming more aware of is that many medicines cause weight gain. So when a patient walks into my office, I try to think about if there are medicines that uh, might be contributing to that weight gain and to try to think of alternatives that might help with that. This is a list that I share with some of my trainees of medicines that cause weight gain in different classes of medicine and then alternatives that are less uh, uh, weight offensive or that actually may cause weight uh, loss uh, so that uh, it's actually relevant for you to ask your doctor, are any of my medicines potentially making me uh, gain weight and is there something else that we could uh, alternatively use? Uh, again, from the uh, guidelines, once we've established what the history of the weight is and whether we're doing something to patients to potentially make them uh, gain weight, uh, we think about potential, we think about nutrition first as the foundation of treatment, but there increasingly are medicines that might help treat several, treat patients, uh, treat the appetite that might come uh, and cause excess weight gain, or treat some of the complications of weight gain. These are uh, a list of the medicines that are available at this point for us to use. One thing that I'd like to mention about this is that the amount of weight loss that you can induce with all these medicines is actually quite small. Uh, it's in the order of, um, uh, as you can see, so the largest one that we have is about six kilos, which is about 10 pounds. Uh, so that's not a huge amount of weight. However, it's enough weight uh, to cause a significant improvement in people's health whether it be in terms of lowering their blood pressure or improving their diabetes, and that's really the goal of what we counsel. Um, this is just a, a comparison. Uh, you heard from Paige about diet, and actually Dr. Sh uh, Dr. Heffron can tell you about exercise. There is a literature in terms of interventions uh, that involve diet and exercise in causing uh, what we call clinically significant, significant weight loss, 5% from baseline. So for a 200-pound person, that would be uh, 10 pounds, for, or 10% for a 200-pound person, that would be a 20-pound weight loss. So diet and exercise work. Uh, it is hard, uh, but they do work. And they work along the same um, uh, percent of patients are able to achieve clinically significant weight loss uh, with lifestyle intervention or with medications in the context of an ideal clinical study. So this is patients that are very interested, very motivated, and have a lot of services uh, provided to them. Um, I will mention one example of medications because we don't have a ton of time, but this is a medicine that, that I think will move to the forefront of treatment of, of, of obesity, and these come in the form of glucagon-like peptide. one agonist. So glucagon-like peptide is a hormone that we didn't know of until about 20 years ago. It's like a different hormone called glucagon, which um, is produced when we eat uh, sugar. And when the sugar actually goes into the gut, uh, this is produced in conjunction with insulin, which is the main uh, hormone that controls blood sugar. And it helps insulin act better. Uh, it, um, through mechanisms that uh, we've understood, it, it helps insulin work better, but it also acts in the brain to decrease appetite. And we think this is the primary mechanism by which uh, it causes weight loss. This is a medicine that initially was approved to treat patients with diabetes. So we give, prescribe it commonly for patients that have diabetes to help improve, uh, decrease their use of insulin. And like any medicine, there's risks and benefits. So there's benefits that you'll see in terms of improving how your body uses your blood sugar, but there's risk in terms of inflammation of your pancreas and theoretical risk of potential cancers. So there's no free ride in that sense. Uh, we, um, we are, uh, this is just, oops, apologize. Okay, sorry. Uh, there is, um, 
there's contraindications that your doctor will be aware of, and there's different types of these. I'll mention one example that we use frequently in the form of liraglutide. This is the generic name. Uh, you might have heard the brand names in the form of Victoza or Sexenda. Um, this is an injectable medicine, so patients often come to the endocrinologist because we prescribe insulin. This involves injecting yourself every day. Um, we know that um, it works very well to decrease, uh, to control your diabetes. Uh, so you can show that your um, average blood glucose will decrease in the order of um, 30 to 50 points. And, uh, and some of the studies show the weight loss that I showed you before in the order of 4.4 kilos or about 10 pounds after a year. And this is one that um, acts through in the brain and also in the pancreas and in the liver to uh, cause its effects in terms of benefiting both the weight and the uh, sugar in your body. All weight loss studies look like this. Uh, and Dr. Heffron showed you some for surgery. Um, in uh, the study that showed that liraglutide works for obesity, even people that enrolled in the study uh, lost weight, meaning that just having that counseling uh, helps really lose it. Now, when you, in the presence of the medicine, you actually see a, a significant decrease in terms of your weight in the order of, again, 10% of your initial um, weight, so about 20 pounds for a 200 uh, person. 20 pounds for a 200 pound person. Importantly, this medicine also prevented uh, insulin resistance. Uh, another definition of insulin resistance is prediabetes. So, but the weight loss and the use of this medicine actually can show that fewer patients over the extent of the study develop diabetes. Uh, so, you're both treating the weight and potentially preventing diabetes. And this is a large part of the reason why these medicines are moving to the forefront. The last reason, which is relevant to what Dr. Heffern mentioned, is that uh, for medicines to be approved to treat diabetes, we have to now show that there's benefit in terms of your heart, that they not only help your blood sugar, but they help your heart. And increasingly, these medicines will have to show that you can have benefit in terms of um, cardiovascular events, that is heart attacks, uh, stroke, uh, or needing a uh, um, stent placed. So uh, liraglutide, among others, have shown that you can actually have a decreased frequency of heart events. So whether it be by the medicine or the weight loss that it causes, that's to be determined. Uh, I'll just end and very briefly to tell you about the research that we do. We're interested in understanding how some people uh, so obese people might be different to each other and why some develop complications versus others. Uh, we focus on inflammation in adipose tissue in a structure that's called a crown like structure, and this is what it is. Uh, and this is one way that you could define whether someone has what we call healthy versus unhealthy obesity. Now, this requires getting a little piece of fat, so that's actually quite invasive, and we only do this in surgery or with procedures. Uh, but we think that this is a separate risk factor that we might be able to potentially treat in the future. Uh, I'll skip this just to tell you that in my postdoc, we actually had people lose weight in the order of what um, I told you about, so 10%, so 10 kilos or about 20 pounds. Uh, these are obese postmenopausal women that came to the Rockefeller uh, Clinical Research Center. That causes improvement in their diabetes and metabolic parameters and also in their circulating inflammation but it does not, uh, or it causes a paradoxical effect in their fat, in their adipose tissue, whereby you get increased immune cells. So we think that in this case, what's happening is that immune cells are coming into fat to help reorganize the fat as you're losing weight. Um, and we can show that by um, different markers, these immune cells at least are not what we think of, of inflammatory cells, but rather might be doing part of a natural role in playing a natural role in the body. Our, uh, that work has led to an initiative here uh, in NYU where we are studying our patients that are undergoing bariatric surgery along with Dr. Heffron and the comprehensive program in obesity, and we have some representatives here today, where we are tracking people who 
are losing weight by surgery and trying to understand what predicts who will do better with surgery so that we can in the future potentially help patients make that decision. Uh, we ask a lot of our patients. Our patients, we ask them to give us blood, stool, and tissue at surgery, so we're very thankful for their participation. Um, and the goal will be to compare patients that have diabetes versus do not have diabetes and how that might impact their success in terms of weight loss surgery.